Hola. <laughs> Just came to me. Hi, this is Jen Grant, and you're Hi, listening. Hi, this is Graham K. Hi, and you are listening. This is Adam Fox, and you're listening. This is to Dylan the... Mandelson, and you're listening to the. This is Brian Hat, and you are listening to the Julian. Hi, this is the Word Man <laughs> of Alcatraz. Señores, señores. Hey, everybody, this is Little Darren Frost. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Mi nombre es Fabio Mantovan, y están escuchando a Julian Dion. This is Dave Sidhu, and you're listening to the Julian Dion Comedy Podcast. Podcast Hour. <laughs> <You're really good. laughs> okay. Showcase. You are listening to the Julian Dion. On Comedy Hour podcast. Hola. Welcome to the Julian Dion Comedy Hour Podcast, episode 18. Hell yeah. Coming at you from Lemon Press Studios in the distillery district downtown Toronto. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, that is a live rendition, live version of uh, Garage Baby performing a beautiful waste of time. That was recorded with my cell phone, so don't judge the quality. Come check it out for yourself tomorrow night at Say What? Wednesday, November 19th. If you're in Toronto, come on out. 67 Front Street East in the distillery, in, in the St. Lawrence area, rather. Rather. Rhubarb. Little dedication to Mike Bennett. Rhubarb. Rhubarb. Uh, that's right. Garage Baby. Come out tomorrow night. It's a great lineup for the Julian Dion Comedy Hour live show. We've got Peter Anthony. We've got Chris Robinson. We've got Alec... Whoa. What happened there? Oh. Oh, it's not the full song. It's not the full song. It's just a uh, part of it. By the way, you can check out that clip at uh, facebook.com slash Hour. That is a clip I recorded, like I said, with my iPhone a couple shows back. And uh, yeah, they're, they're, Garage Baby is amazing live. Come check them out tomorrow. and uh, Or listen to any other episode off the top to get a broadcast quality version of that song. It's usually really good. I mean, it is really good. It's just the quality. It's good now what I just play. It's just, you know, it's not so grainy usually. Alex Nussbaum will also be on the show tomorrow. It's going to be a good one. Jen Grant. We'll do a guest spot. It's fun. It's fun. Come on out. You just des- you deserve it. Do yourself a favor, and uh, you deserve it. Deserve, deserve. My guest today, Doctor Michel Rice, or Michael Rice, or Michel Riss. <laughs> Michel Rice. He's a chiropractor, but uh, I interviewed him. He's actually been uh, coming to Lemon Press Studios for a few sessions, recording sessions. He's recording an audiobook that will be published uh, in the new year, Sex and the Single Spine, written by Dr. Michelle Rice. He's, uh, I, I like the guy. He's a great guy. He's uh, vi- vital. Vital? He's full of vitality. <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying this, but anyway, he's, like I've said before, in the, co- pot, the cod pass, holy shit. Pulling a Dave Sidhu, episode one. Check it out. In the, well, you heard it in the bumper, the Julian Dion comedy cod pass. Anyway, oh, God, I'm all over the map. I had another half-calf, half-decaf coffee today. I'm slipping. <laughs> this, this sober living, I'm, I've treated myself to half-decaf coffee for the couple couple days. Anyway, what was I saying? Dr. Michelle Rice, my guest. The whole mandate of this podcast is to introduce to you and interview and uh, 
pick the brains of creative, successful people. And I mentioned this in the interview, but you know, for me, uh, when I think chiropractor, I usually imagine someone that goes to med school, chiropractic school, they graduate, they get a practice or a partner in a practice, then they do that for 25, 30 years and retire. Very in the box sort of thing. Well, where Dr. Michelle Rice, uh, where I wanted to interview him is he's thought outside the box his entire career. He's 54 years old and he's retired essentially, and he's uh, carved out a niche for himself and a great living, and he's been really successful at, again, like I said, thinking outside the box, and uh, we'll get to know and, uh, and and learn about the good doctor, also fighting the good fight. You'll, you'll hear all about it. Enjoy the interview coming up shortly, but first, what do we say? What do we, what do we, what do we get into? Thank you for listening, by the way. I, I appreciate it. I've been a little lax on re- release dates and lacks, I mean, just f- f- too much life, as I've complained about in other podcast monologues. It's just too much. I get overwhelmed. And so the release dates. But starting next week, that would be, let me check the date, next week, Tuesday. Okay, I'm going to make a promise to you, listeners. And I'm going to keep my word, word, work, word. Starting on Tuesday, November 25th, I will be releasing episodes every Tuesday and Friday. At midnight that day. So technically like Monday night, but early Tuesday morning. So when you get up Tuesday morning, you'll have the podcast there ready to go. So thank you. Because uh, some people have been emailing about, you know, sometimes it comes out at night. Sometimes it comes out a little later. But uh, for the most part, I'm going to do... No, no, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do it. Okay. Holy shit. What was that? What was that? Did you hear that? I, I probably couldn't even do that again if I tried. Is that picking up? Are you getting that vibrating sound? Hold on, let me try that again. What the fuck is that? Anyway, okay, professional. This is a professional show, which is why I'm making the commitment to you to release the podcasts on time. Make sure to uh, be sure to rate and subscribe on iTunes. It's very important. That makes a huge difference. Few people. I got a two star review and I didn't sleep for eight days. So if you could keep it up to five stars, that'd be great. <laughs> Anything under five stars, keep it to yourself. Everything five stars and over, you can't go over. Everything five stars, just just rate it. Go on iTunes, get the podcast app, or go on the podcast app, whatever, and uh, just write, it says write a review. You don't even have to write a review. Just just click the five stars. <laughs> if you agree with me, if you don't, just I love you. Email the show podpod at jdcomedyhour.com. I'm getting some good emails that I will read on Friday's episode. But today, uh, what can we talk about? Life? Sure. Let's do a little bit of this. And now, Flash News Flash with Julian Dion. All right. So I've t- tried out this this uh, segment before, Flash News Flash, where the original concept came from. Uh, basically, I would rip through all the headlines of today uh, really fast, and I tried it once. It was weird. It wasn't. I got an email asking or suggesting that I should um, look for more interesting, maybe uh, bizarre sort of headlines, and I sort of wanted to attack it from the like Jim Cramer, the the angry f- money guy, whatever his show where he's just all over the place. I sort of wanted to do something like that, but instead, I'm just going to talk about some of the headlines in the news. You know, what's happening in the world? W- what are we dealing with? Well, K- Kim Kardashian is naked out there. She came out on Friday, last Friday, a uh, paper magazine in New York came up with a article or spread, I guess. Kim Kardashian, she's naked. Her And the name of the article or the attempt was to, quote, break the internet to get people freaked out. And people were freaking out all over the... Uh, hating on it or defending it. And I'm in the category of who gives a shit? Really, who cares? Kim Kardashian's naked, whoopty shit. You know, her claim to fame is a sex tape, right? That's what was... That's why we know who she is now, is because she was she fucked on camera, and she became really popular, and then she did a whole lot of nothing for a few years, other than just be the girl that fucked on camera one time, and then all of a sudden she poses nude and people flip out, like she's a mom, whatever, she's a grown woman, she's 
you know, she's married to Kanye. <laughs> he could have stepped in at any point. Who gives a shit? Why are people so... Yeah, Kim Kardashian showed her tits and ass in a thing, and she has a kid. Well, that's her problem. That's not your problem. That's not... That's not your energy to waste on that. Who, who gives a flying fuck? And the attempt was to break the internet, and turns out it didn't break the internet at all, actually. Not even close. The internet, check it out. Still working. You, know, you can hear me. I was typing. Yep. Full internet. Got it. Not broken. And if it's any reflection on our society, more people tweeted about the, the uh, spacecraft landing on the comet than they did about her ass. So... There you go, Kim Kardashian. You did not break the internet. Maybe you would have if you would have had a spacecraft land on your ass. And that's another thing. The spacecraft landing on the comet, that also received a, a lot of controversy. Uh, you know, women are a lot in the news recently for good cause for the most part. Well, not not good cause. Well, I mean, it's good that we're bringing these things up, but they're... They're, uh, you know, like the Kim Kardashian thing, objectifying women, and then the comet. The the spacecraft landing on an asteroid, that received some controversy because one of the scientists interviewed by a reporter was wearing a, quote, controversial, uh, offensive shirt. And that threw the internet, that almost broke the internet, more than the comet landing on the thing. The scientist was offensive with his shirt. I don't know if you saw the shirt, but it's basically... It, but, by the way, designed by a woman, and it depicts um, cartoon women that are s dressed scantily cladly. Scantily cladly? <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like in a bustier, but they're cartoons. They're not even pictures of real, real uh, women. It's all, it's, they're drawings. Draw drawings. My name is Soyman, and I like to do some drawings. They're drawings. Of w women. And again, designed by a woman. By the name of Ellie Prizman. Anyway, that turns out the scientist in question, Matt Taylor, was really surprised about the controversy because he didn't think about it. You know why? Because he was busy trying to think of a way to land a fucking spacecraft on an asteroid. He just put on his shirt. And I read an article online on TheVerge.com that said, Quote, this is the sort of casual misogyny that stops women from entering, entering certain scientific fields. Oh my god, really? This? A cartoon shirt? So let me get this straight. You're a woman, and you're dedicated and focused on scientific research, and it's your passion, and you love it, and you really want to do it, you want to pursue it, but you see a cartoon shirt on, a, on TV worn by scientists that depicts women in bustiers and leather I don't know I don't know and you're all of a sudden you know what I'm not going to I'm not going to I don't want this is not what I want to do okay I get it there inequality in the workplace is a real thing okay I get that 100% and it shouldn't be and it's fucked up but why raise such a fuss about a shirt a cartoon shirt that was worn on TV by a scientist who made leaps and bounds for, for humanity, contributed towards that, contributed more, more than most people who are complaining about the shirt, mind you. But that goes unmentioned. This guy's doing something for all of humankind. The progression. But yet his shirt gets more news than what he's actually accomplishing. Okay, why do we get so bent out of shape about that, but a show like Dragon's Den or Shark Tank, for example, in the States... Inequality in the workplace isn't even mentioned, or sexism, never on that show, but that is the most blatant display of it ever that you can see right there on national TV. I'll give you an example. You watch Dragon's Den or Shark Tank or any other show like it where you have a panel of, you know, four or five billionaires. It's four guys, one woman. And, okay, pitch after pitch, everything's normal. They act and behave as normal humans do. But then all of a sudden... Out comes a beautiful entrepreneur, stunning woman comes down, and you see the shift of the panel. Everybody starts making jokes. Oh, I'm in. Oh, I'm definitely in. I don't know what you're selling, but I'm buying. How much? Sold. You're getting a deal. They start commenting on her appearance, sexualizing that person, giving her, you know, an unfair, putting her in an unfair and uncomfortable position, but nobody ever addresses that. I watched that show, Dragon's Den or Shark Tank, I watched those shows 
a significant amount. And every time I'm blown away, I'm like, how is this on TV? No one's sending an email or calling it out or going to Twitter about it. Full on misogyny on that show. Full on. Beautiful woman comes out. Tongues roll out. Eyes pop out. And they start commenting on it. And they make crack jokes. They don't take her seriously. They crack jokes through the presentation. The attractive woman in in this case really needs to step up and have an amazing presentation to shake the notion that or, or the the fact that she's sexy or whatever. It, but no one says anything. But one scientist wears a cartoon shirt, and it's just the end of the world. And I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I am. But if I am, just email me pod at um, horseradish.ca because I don't want to hear it. Women are in the news a lot, and it's not good. It's, uh, you know, horrible situation. Bill Cosby, he's all over the news. I think up to now 13 or possibly 15 women, um, don't quote me on that number, have come forward with rape allegations. And that's fucked up. That's not, that's not good for the cause. And he's, he's just, all he's been doing is keeping quiet, canceling appearances, Dodging everything. And I don't know. You know, there's there's two there's two minds on this. There's the wall, he's innocent until proven guilty. Or he's obviously guilty. Look at these people. But you know, I'm sort of in the middle. It's like, yeah, okay, the justice system ha- he hasn't gone through the justice system yet. He should. But at the same time you can't discredit fifteen or twelve 10, 6, 3 women that come forward with rape allegations, you can't just right away make the leap that, oh, he's famous, so they're going after his money because he's a celebrity. You can't make that right away. You have to give them... I honestly think he's... he's, he's I think he did it. What, what does my opinion matter? It doesn't. I'm just saying, for 13 women to come forward, or 15, or whatever, it's pretty serious shit. And why won't you come out and defend yourself right away? His his publicist released some bullshit statement about how these came up in the past, but um, you know now that they're resurfacing, doesn't make them true. I don't know. I think uh, the cause is uh, is fucked up, and I feel for the women. And it's it's too bad for the women in this case when it, it's against a celebrity because right away people take the celebrity side because it's be- beloved Bill Cosby. He, it's Dr. Huxtable. He can, there's no way. These women have got to be lying. They must be lying, which is really unfair because, you know, I, I'm going to say they're not. But right away, they're, which is why they, they keep quiet for 20 years, because they're, they know they're going to, they're going against the, the masses here. They're going to shatter the public image that is Bill Cosby. Anyway. Uh, cause you're, you're in a mess, you're in a mess and you have to clear it up and you have to serve the time. You have to, you have to own it. Okay. I know you're listening, billcosby.com. Anyway, that's, this is a riveting comedy podcast topic, but you know what? If you don't like it, once again, email the show pod pod at calendar post master dot Org. Okay, we're going to get to my guest right now. Let's drop the interview and uh, enjoy it. It's a good chat, inspirational, motivational. It's good. Uh, Dr. Michelle Rice is a, is a good guy, and I'm glad he uh, lent me the time to uh, pick his brains and get to know what makes the man. So enjoy my chat now with uh, Dr. Michelle Rice. You and me below. Just like the flowers, laughing all day long. People, I need to lose. Sing a little song, then take a shower. Julian Dion, comedy hour. Okay. Someone, um, someone should interview you. Someone should interview me. I can prepare questions. Come yep. back. Pre- pre- prepare questions. Okay, welcome. Uh, I'm, I sit here with my guest today. The whole mission statement of this podcast when I started is to interview, get to know, and introduce to you, the listener, uh, fascinating 
interesting and creative people. My guest today is a now retired chiropractor, and, and he's taken a bit of a creative um, direction with his with his uh, career, if I may. He's uh, the author of uh, Sex and the Single Spine, and he's done many, many things. And uh, we'll just get into it. Dr. Uh, Michel Rice sits in Lemon Press Studios. How you doing, my man? I am doing great, and thank you for having me. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. You've already been here um, for 10.25 hours. We did the math. We just <laughs> recorded your audiobook in, um, in here in Lemon Press Studios. Uh, and I wanted to interview you because you have, like I said, you have taken sort of a creative approach to your career. When, when someone tells says chiropractor to me, I envision like the path to be, you go to med school, you get out of med school, you have a practice for 25, 30 years, and then you retire sort of thing. But I mean, you're a young guy. You're 53. I am 54. 54. Mm -hmm. I was off. My researcher One is officially year. fired. <laughs> I'm going to fire my researcher. Um and you're already retired, and you, um, you're going back to med school. You've written a book. You've gone to film school. So I kind of want to get your um, perspective on how. Also, and your approach was creative in the way that you didn't just have, like you did fun things like you were a chiropractor on set for music videos that came through town and all that. So let's start a little bit with your background. Let's go back. You're, you're a Franco-Ontarian. From Timmins. From Timmins, Ontario. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize Timmins had a French population there. Huge. Oh, yeah? Huge. Because you know what? They come up from northern Quebec. Mm. Right? So they work in forestry, mining, and then the jobs take them from northern Quebec to northern Ontario. So I'd have to say more than 70% French up there. Wow. And uh, so you came to... Did you speak any English at all growing mm. up? I only spoke French. Oh, yeah? And when I came to Toronto... Uh, in 1978, I could hardly speak English so much that I avoided meeting English people oh, yeah. in Toronto, believe it or not. I was in residence at Fisher House, mm -hmm. St. Michael's College at UFT, and I would cross the street just so that I didn't have to say good morning to the guys <laughs> in residence. <laughs> That's like avoiding anyone that speaks uh, Cantonese in, in China. Like, how do you do, like come to Toronto, avoid English people? And here's the ridiculous part is I took French courses to bring up my GPA, and I would pretend to be an English person trying to learn French. So here's a French guy trying to speak as an English person who can't speak English with a French accent. That's meta. That's like uh, linguistic... Uh, Inception. Have you seen that movie, Inception? That's like, no, I just called it Survival back then. Survival, right. Inception's a movie about like a dream within a dream within a dream. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With, uh, yeah, so this is like a um, an accent within an accent, doing an accent, pretending to have an accent. Uh, and so you're late 70s in, in med school, right? No, I, well, th that was my undergrad at oh. UFT. Oh, that was your undergrad. Mm -hmm. And where did you go to? Where did you go to? So from uh, the bachelor's degree, you mm -hmm. apply, and so I got into uh, chiropractic college, CMCC, Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. And it's the and only one, right? Is it, it's, is it? it was at the time the only one in Canada. Right. There is another one now in Quebec for f the French only. Okay. Part of the University de Quebec. So any chiropractor in Canada goes to that school? Or if you go to the States, you, you, you can still come in. You just have to write your boards. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then you... So how is that being French? And I mean, because there's a little bit of that now, like the Anglo and, and Franco divide, but back then it must have been even more. Like. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was so bad that, you know, because it was the only school in Canada, chiropractic... They have to accept so many from every province. So they accepted right. about like 35 Quebecers. So here I am, the guy who is still very much French, but is in, but can speak English now, right? Because then I'm considered a Torontonian. I've been in the city for four years. Um, and so I would try to hang with the French people, <laughs> and mm -hmm. they would kind of reject me because they considered me English. And then the English rejected me because I spoke with a very thick 
accent. Right. <laughs> so I was kind of lost between the two cultures. <laughs> you were in limbo. You were you were shunned by everyone. Well, maybe you should have picked up Cantonese. You could have <laughs> found another group of people. Well, as a matter of fact, the Asian uh, uh, there was very few Asians back mm -hmm. then in Toronto, mm -hmm. and we did have a couple and one one Asian woman. Uh, Remember that to be a chiropractor, you got to be strong. You got to be able to hold, uh, you know, a 250 pound man and jump mm -hmm. on him to manipulate his spine, right? Mm -hmm. So she had a lot of trouble because she was, you know, they're very petite. Uh, and so she had many mishaps of patients falling on her and right during. So, yeah. <laughs> and why chiropractic? What, what got you into that? Well, Toronto. Yeah. I didn't want to leave Toronto, so I wanted to be a dentist mm -hmm. throughout uh, high school. So I applied in, uh, at U of T Dental, and you got to write the, what they call a dental aptitude test. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did very well, thank you, except one category, the reading comprehension, because it was English. So I got one on nine. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh the, the one on nine is kind of like a they place you like percentile so mm -hmm. i was in the bottom 30th percentile okay so what happened was i thought okay you know what those buggers i'm gonna redo the test and this time i'm going to read it as fast as i can and answer all the questions because i had hardly answered any of the questions right so i did that and got the results and I got one on nine again. <laughs> well, this time with answers. <laughs> they were just all bad answers. So then, you know, like I was determined, right? So I right. thought, okay, you know what? Those buggers, <laughs> this time I'm going to drive myself to Montreal and write the reading comprehension in French. I did the DAT mm -hmm. in French at l'Université de Montréal. So I wrote the test and I got the results and I got... Two on that. <laughs> <laughs> progress. Which, <laughs> which is progress. 50% better. Well, lucky for me, the cutoff mark was two on nine. Wow. So uh, to be, to uh, if you go below the averages of their cutoff marks, you can't even apply, right? Well, so that is a pretty low bar, though, too. Two for out of reading, nine. considering yeah. what well, dentists can, they can't really read anyways, right? right. They don't do. So, uh, Take what? Ass dentists. <laughs> So what I did is I applied to University of Montréal, got in there, didn't get into U of T, and, mm -hmm. but I got into chiropractic. So what really did it for me, though, is I spent an hour with the dentist and an hour with the chiro to really decide, you know. And I love the chiropractic part because the chiro was seeing the patients, examining the patients, stethoscope, listening to the heart sounds, you know. So I thought, wow, he's like a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then he was like a mechanic, grabbing people, pulling them, cracking them, adjusting them, you know. And then he was a radiologist, taking x-rays and reading them. So I thought there's a lot of jobs and there's mm -hmm. a lot of... So if you have multiple personality disorders, it's the perfect job for you, right? <laughs> and do you have multiple personality <laughs> Am well, I talking to Michelle Rice right now? <laughs> he is here in the room. Uh, and uh, I tell people that I'm on the committee for uh, the interview committee for chiropractic. And mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of look for that personality trait in the interview process mm -hmm. to see if they're multifaceted, if the people are really. Right. Although I have to say that all the guys look like hockey players. They're all handsome and they look like hockey players. Mm -hmm. And the woman, it kind of like, there's not really, a, I think, a, a, a consistent physical trait to the female chiropractor. But the, the guys, for sure, there's a. Uh, and so you you went on a sort of um, you sat in with and, and how was the sitting with the dentist was that like ugh I don't want to do this uh, you pretty much summed it yeah <laughs> and they say out of all the doctor professions dentist has the highest rate of suicide mm -hmm. that uh, I'm not disputing that yeah. statistic no there it still is actually to you know like sometimes a statistic. The governing bodies have, uh, you know, programs that help, you know, because this is like research-based mm -hmm. evidence, right? And this was the case in 1970. And if you look at the stats now, they're still the same, right. which is kind of ironic. 50 mm. years, you know, like not 50, but... Uh, like 100. <laughs> I'm bad at math, too. Um, so when you graduate... So you sort of fell in love in Toronto. So that sort of dictated... The geography sort of dictated your career path in a way. 
It did uh, at the time. At the time. But when I graduated, I have to say that, you know, I wanted my parents to see me, uh, the chiropractor. You know, back then, you know, like, you know, my mother uh, took an extra job to mm-hmm. try to help me. And then we had OSAP, you know. But by, back then, tuition fees for Cairo were really, really high compared to any other faculty. You're the only school in Canada and stuff. So... So I wanted to go up there, and uh, Gilles Lamarche, uh, Dr. Gilles Lamarche, is uh, was very well known up there. Very, very busy practice. Did you know? Was very prosperous up there. So he he wanted me to go up, and he was uh, to be his associate, and I got to be in Timmins. So I did this for about a year, and then uh, I Toronto brought me back from an academic perspective. Uh, I liked the lifestyle very much. I worked two days a week. I'd fly down to Toronto all the time, you know, so it was it was a good lifestyle, but I wanted to study more. So I did a fellowship in chiropractic sports sciences. I should say I'm an associate of the fellow. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so uh, that needed, I needed to be in Toronto to get back in school for that. So that's what brought you back. It wasn't, was there ever an element of, because uh, cause when you leave home, it's you've, you're all of a sudden free and you discover all this culture and stuff away from home and then you kind of get homesick. You're like, I, I'm ready to go back. And then for me personally, then you go back and you're like, oh, get me the fuck out of here. Was there any of that? Were you like happy to go back to Toronto or were you kind of torn at the time? Like, uh, I guess I should go for my career or, or where? what was your stance on that? Mm-hmm. The, like for that year when you went back to Timmins, did you think you'd be there for for a long, long time? No. No, no. Right from the beginning, I knew that it 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 the lifestyle isn't for me. I mean, I like fishing, hunting, you know, mm-hmm. like all of these. But they're not. There's a difference between doing it once in a while and living it. Right. And you know that I have, uh, you know, Native American mm-hmm. uh, or Aboriginal uh, blood, and. I have to say, you know, my brothers, my three brothers and my father, they're true Aboriginal, you know, fishermen, hunters. Mm-hmm. But for me, I was more the academic in the family. So, it, you know, when I was up there, I knew I would come back. And it was not, uh, you know, it was a, a, a way to catch up with family when I went up there. Because right. I had been to Toronto in Toronto eight years. Right, right. right. And you know it's a it's also an exciting time of life. You're you're you know your brothers start having babies, mm-hmm. and you know you, so you you know you want to experience that the home family life again. And uh, I did that, but I was able to f- to come to Toronto a lot, right? Because I, lucky for me, you know, I w- my income level permitted me to do that, mm-hmm. and I was my own boss, so I can set my own hours. So it wasn't an, a thing of I'm going to go up there and I'm going to isolate myself. Like a fisherman and a hunter, right? right? I was able to do both. Uh, so I, I would like to go back and fish and hunt, but when you're older, you just get busier and and the and the and the marangouin bug <laughs> bug. <laughs> uh, marangouin. Let's uh, Google that for any all your English listeners. <laughs> marangouin. That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> Because that's not a real, is, is that, that's an Acadian word, I always thought, or... or oh, yeah, oh, yes, because I think uh, the proper word is... Uh, moustique. Moust, moustique? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which Isn't is a mos- barbecue? mosquito. I was, like, looking for barbecue chips the other day. And mesquite. Saw, oh, mesquite, yeah. <laughs> Black fly flavored <laughs> chips. <laughs> um, so you mentioned your income. When you, is chiropractic something that, because I know there's certain fields, medical fields, that it takes a while to build up. Were you fortunate in in that regard when you left? Do you write? Are you like off to the races immediately? Yes. Thank you, Doctor Gilles Lamarche. It was an interesting because he time. took you under his wing and yeah. sort of yeah. So that really yeah. helped you. Yeah, he was very progressive though. He knew he was going to give me patience, and so he, you know, he made me go to the bank. I had to pay into the kind of like practice as an associate it's it's kind of like what they do now mm-hmm. but this is again you know it's a long time ago and so dr lamarche was very much a, a business visionary and sign on this paper you're going to get a brand new uh a, a 1987 toyota celica gts <laughs> loaded and that was a big deal back then yeah, you know yeah. and also here's fifty thousand dollars and that's going to come to us and we're going to give you more than fifty thousand dollars worth of patients so 
So I was lucky that way. Mm-hmm. I, w- I got into six digit income even back then mm-hmm. right away. So, and I've had really good years. Can since. it, can it be tough for chiropractors when they leave med school to, st- if they decide to start their own practice, can there be some hard years? It is. With, it, even with that, that DR in front of your name? Yes. Now, now, especially now. Really? Yeah. It's kind of like law now too, right? Like, right, right. They can't, they aspire to become, you know, uh, the Lincoln uh, lawyer. <laughs> no, I was going to say uh, partners, but now right. they're, they're all associates. You mm-hmm. can't become, especially in Toronto, you know, it, it's too hard mm-hmm. for them. So they, they, they get paid, uh, you know, very, very minimal, I think, uh, because it's demand and supply, right? Right. So how many years did you do your typical chiropractor, chiropracting practice where it's like Monday to Friday, you work regular hours? How many years did you do that? I did that for about 20. 20 years. 20 years. And uh, I was, a, yeah, like you said, Monday to Friday. So it, yeah. it kind of like was working like that. But uh, I really progressed. It got exciting for me when I moved to Toronto because I did, I was doing something that was kind of like futuristic. I'm, I, uh, I kind of pioneered the concept of boutique private fitness in Toronto. Mm-hmm. It was called Enersis at Young and St. Clair. And uh, what it was is about giving people trainers while they worked out because although, you know, fixing patients, fixing their headaches and their back pain was, you know, exciting, acute care. Uh, when it came down to maintenance care, seeing them once a month, I wasn't like big on just continued care. Once you see a chiropractor, you have to go all the time, that kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So, and I knew that the end result for all musculoskeletal dysfunctions, diseases, you know, is you got to work out. Mm -hmm. You got to do strength workout. It's the magic. So I thought, you know, instead of the big gym and the super fitness gold's gym back then, I thought, let's do something private for people, make it affordable for them. And uh, now there are tons of them in Toronto. Yeah, there are a lot. Yeah, and and they're still making a mistake right. that I wasn't making back then. And that mistake is that they are, first of all, they're um, using the health plans mm-hmm. of the patients. Uh, and so they go broke really fast in their health plan, and they're too expensive. So that doesn't promote continued service. Right. You know, uh, the person will be inspired for a month, two months. Then they realize, wait, that's a thousand dollars a month. I mm. can't afford that. And then they quit. So that's still a problem. And so what I did in the last years is I tested a prototype and I called it brave this time, brave health because of the Indian thing. And, uh, everybody that came to see me had to have an Indian name. So for example, you could be like, uh, I don't know, what would you? Uh, black fly hunter. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that, that, uh, okay, so black fly hunter uh, would come in and you would have your program and I would custom design the program all around your dysfunctions. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mental and physical. And so what we do is, uh, I, you know, like you'd have injuries, history, right? So, and you have dreams, like you told me you'd, pref- you'd love to have big tits. So I would design a pec major program a lot of chest exercises following you know strength principles so everybody's workouts was personal three on the floor every half hour was my magic Mm -hmm. and so the trainer could work three at a time six people per hour and it was very very educational based too so you teach the warrior not the not the member the warrior everybody became a warrior so black fly hunter would come in he'd put his program up the trainer would say Okay, what's your next exercise? And they would expect you to know your workouts and your Mm -hmm. workout principles. And every 30 workouts, I changed everything. You started over and I build you up, right? More advanced. And that was hugely successful, but it tired me out and I tried to sell it and no chiropractor wanted to come. And they come in and they'd say like, I can't program 1,200 visits a month. Right. It was like I was four times busier than anybody else and Mm -hmm. I couldn't replace it. And so, and what background did you have other than, because you did sports chiropractic? Yes. Is that, is that, yeah. is that all you had to? To do this? No, I think any chiropractor can do it, really. Uh, you know, the sports chiropractic I thought would help me, you know, but that's more for specialty, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like I was on the triage with uh, uh, the uh, 
Mount Sinai uh, Dr. Uh, Taylor and uh, when I practiced. And mm-hmm. so uh, they do the Blue Jays and stuff, right? So having that specialty allowed you entry for referral basis with these big guns in Toronto mm-hmm. that still exist, you know? That must be a hard job to get, those kind of... Yeah, like you got to know people. Chiropractor for the Blue Jays, or like yeah. you said. you got to know. And uh, when did you start... Like, when did you, when did that entrepreneurial side of you kick in where, because, because when you first came to Toronto after Timmins, did you have your own practice before no. the, before the gyms and personal training? No, were, only in, I was just an associate. You were an associate. There, never became a partner. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I came to Toronto, it was just, I just did a proposal on the concept because I had experience clinically. I got busy fast. And it was always the end results. You got to work out. You got to work out. You got to work out. So, so that's what you got into immediately when you came back to Toronto. Was, yes. Oh, this okay. Got it. This yeah. boutique uh, yeah. fitness approach. Yeah. And how many locations did you have? Uh, about six. All in the all city. All together. All downtown. And uh, and I got. You're gonna wonder. Well, why? You know, why shut a good thing, right? Yeah. And what happened to me was uh, I got a huge contract with Toronto Hydro Mm -hmm. uh, using they came in they saw what I was doing they loved it they wanted me to test it with their employee workforce not Ontario Hydro Toronto Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they had 1600 people in their workforce so I did a pilot project competed against all the big guns in Toronto Uh, uh, you know uh, Canadian Back Institute back then TriFit you know and I got the contract because I said let's figure out what your people want first and what they need So physical assessments, I gave them all personal programs and uh, it was a huge success. And so what happened is they they wanted to keep me on full time. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, on one hand, Toronto Hydro, you have offices in their place and they pay for everything. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Toronto uh, is very, very, very cost prohibitive for most Mm -hmm. you know expenses can run even back then they were like ten thousand a month uh and so it's really hard you know you're always trying to balance the you know the revenues with your expenses and stuff so i thought this would be an easier way and i could continue to expand on my concept at toronto hydro so that's kind of like i so i i kind of took that road and then um toronto hydro did not want to spend the money on wellness programs. They made me present it at the International Conference of Wellness in the Workplace. I'll try to say that 10 times in a row. <laughs> and, uh, and it was great. The mayor was there. It was a big deal. They showed off what, uh, what uh, Enersys had done with Toronto Hydro and the six huge successes because we kept 75% of the population after six months. And the Ministry of Education and Fitness, you know, whatever it's called, they were saying... Uh, uh, I think it's consumer relations, which is ironic. Uh, They said that I should have only had 20%. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, the program works. You give someone attention, they're going to dance, right? Uh, But they couldn't spend the money. Uh, And so still today, a service center uh, down on, um, you know, where Canadian Tire is on Lakeshore there, they still, they have a ping pong table in in the facilities where we were supposed to do. And I'm hoping maybe one day I'll help them, but not at this time in my career, you know? Right. But uh, so that's when I did Brave again because I thought, okay, I missed it too much. I gravitated to it too much, mm-hmm. you know. So I redid it again, hugely successful again. But then I got tired because uh, I got into the X-ray and the motor vehicle accident um, uh, specialty mm-hmm. uh, using X-ray, and that's that's a whole ball game all into itself, right? Challenging insurance companies and insurance lawyers and doctors, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so that was. I, and I had the balls to do it. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. So you mean you would defend people? Because insurance companies have, you know, departments of underwriters, which are paid huge money to find any sort of reason to not pay out. And so that was your job to... It still is my job today. Still, to, I, hugely. Right. Hugely. So I work with all the big law firms and I work in defense law, mm-hmm. doing exactly what you said. You get hit by a car, you have injuries... The minor injury guideline, the new law in Ontario that's been in effect for like four years now, gives you only 3500 bucks to fix you. Mm-hmm. Now, if the doctor examines you and takes 600 out of that, now you only have 9000 2900 mm-hmm. And so if massages cost 100 do the math, right? It'll you'll last a month. Right. 
And so, and everything falls into the minor injury. The way it's worded, a fracture in your spine is a minor injury. No way. So what I do is I, I take x-rays, specialty x-rays, that will find major injuries. And if you're major, you get $50,000 and you mm. get out of this stupid law called the minor injury guideline. So, uh, it's an, it's so, so I wait until their care is done, the minor injury guidelines is done, and then if the patient has what I call clinical markers, such as, oh yeah, you know what, I move my neck and I still feel cracking since the accident, or I'm dizzy, and uh, I have ringing in my ears. Or they should be better by now, three months down the road, but they're not. They plateaued at 40, 50. These are kind of like markers that, you know what, there's something on, going on in there, right? Mm -hmm. So they send them to the doctors that work for the insurance companies, and they just do physical exams. And actually this morning, I was just talking to uh, Dr. Califala, an orthopedic surgeon on this. Is like, you know, we have the technology now that we can do orthopedic surgeries and put screws and play to you without even cutting you open. Right. Right? Everything is just MRI. And, and his training was in England, which is more old school using, you know, percussion and your finger and tapping on the finger. And then he comes here and it's all techie, high tech. But yet now the insurances, what they do is they hire these doctors and the doctors will examine you using this old fashioned, well, I looked at the guy and he was able to sit in this chair and he didn't flinch and he didn't cry. And uh, so I think he's fine. Right. This is, this literally, this is what it's like. And you know, like, it's not my opinion because in the process, I have to fight for these people. Mm -hmm. So if I find these major injuries and these major injuries are easy to find, 1940s x-ray process, you take the patient and you have them bend as far forward as possible and high, as far high extended as possible. And then there's a whole, the AMA, American Medical Association has, okay, with an x-ray, this is how you do it. And if your result, if you take your measurements and they're beyond these, that means that there's like ligaments that have been cut from the sudden deceleration of the impact, right? right? So things are moving too much because you're all ripped up inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't measure that. You can't have the guy sitting in a chair and do a range of motion, right? right? And uh, and I tell patients, you know, if you were a horse and you ripped all the ligaments in your knees, we shoot you in the face. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and so <laughs> you're kind of rendered useless. And the reason why is because those injuries don't repair. So you can't mm -hmm. hang their, the horse and give him IV, and he'll fix. He'll be fixed, right? right? And so in humans, it's a permanent injury, which is why it's a major injury. So I do these tests. I find them, believe it or not, in seventy percent of patients who've suffered right? more than. Th so I will probably be uh, knocked off by an insurance gunman <laughs> one day, I figure, because <laughs> I've got the, I really have the solution to finding these injuries that, the key word here, objectively. Mm -hmm. There's the proof, x-ray, hello, right? right? So here's the thing, I find this, I tell the insurances, they still say, oh yeah, whatever, we're gonna send them to our doctor, the doctors that work for the insurance companies will examine the patient their way. Oh, yeah, he was able to sit in the chair. And yeah, he seems okay, yeah. And believe it or not, they ignore my x-rays. They ignore my report. They ignore everything that I gave them. So they, they're not guilty of anything if they ignore it. Right. Right? And so now this is where I come in and I say in a very polite way, are you a fucking idiot or what? I told you before you even examine the patient, come and take my x-rays. Here, I'll even give you a protractor and a ruler so you can measure yourself. Mm -hmm. It takes about 45 minutes. I know they'll never do it, but it's objective, right? I have a technician. I have Dr. Sable, a, a medical radiologist, and I'm the chiropractor behind you know, the, uh, and I have a, another accreditation called AADEP from the American, American Academy of Disability Evaluating Physicians. You can tell I've had three coffees, right? <laughs> AADEP. And these are doctors that actually I'm quantifying. I can quantify people to give them a percentage of how bad permanently injured they are. So for example, if you get your right arm and your penis cut off, your penis is 7% and your right arm is 15 Okay, off the top of my head, my head, I'm saying this, right? It seems like low for a penis. Well, that's what all the women say. Because uh, <laughs> I kind of actually start my, my uh, legal seminars this way, and all the, the women giggle and say, we think it should be high. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but truly, it's very low, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
pretty much everything that can happen to you from a car accident is quantified on a percentage basis. So if you're 100% impaired, that makes you dead, mm -hmm. right? And you need to be a certified physician for this. So I have that certification in you, Canada. You, you need to be a certified physician to... Um Assess. Di di assess someone as 100% impaired. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and if the pe penis is gone, I, right. I can s give them a certificate saying that they're 7%, you know? Right. So in my case, I'm, you know, I'm really like soft tissue injuries, right? Mm -hmm. Like fractures, dislocations, amputations. Soft, sometimes hard tissue. Am I right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's interesting. So you joke about being... Uh, taken out by an insurance company do you is there a little party that's actually a little bit paranoid about that like maybe not to that extreme but but because you are taking on big uh, conglomerates that have a lot of money and that uh imagine imagine if the government of ontario required people to have this as a mandate mm -hmm. how much money the ministry of health would save from all these extra tests and extra medical visits because the patient keeps suffering and oh let's try an mri the doctors don't know you know, it's a lot of work even for me to try to explain to the doctor what this injury is. It's all, it's all orthopedics, right? Mm -hmm. And I have to, I, and I give them the research papers. It's not me, right? Mm -hmm. it's the, they just got to do the work, right? And my report references as well, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, imagine the billions of dollars that the insurance companies will have to, to pay to properly rehabilitate and this is the key word. There's no suffering in the province of Ontario. You don't get millions. It's not like the United States. But at least the people would have more than 3,500. Right. They would have better quality of life. They would have hope because, believe it or not, how you rehabilitate these injuries is not by uh, cracking it, adjusting it, and pulling on the neck and overstretching. That always hurts the patient more. Mm -hmm. So it's important for the physios and the chiros and the people working on these patients to know what's moving too much inside their bodies mm -hmm. as a result of the accident. And it can only be from a, de a sudden deceleration injury, which brings me to why I went to med school as research brought me there because I needed cadavers. And I wanted to have as many heads as possible, basically necks and heads, to traumatize them the way that Volvo did so that you can create the injury. So I would hold on to a head and I would run into the wall as fast as I can, holding on to the dead head. And then I would, I'm kidding. It's oh, a joke. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. You're going, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I was going to be like, holy <laughs> shit. No wonder you're already retired. <laughs> yeah. I'd quit everything if I had to take a dead head and run into a wall. <laughs> but the truth is that um, I, I, at St. James, what I did is I did, I did, I did cut the head and the neck. And I did, I, what I did is I created the injury. So I, I cut the ligaments like it was, and then I would put the head in an aquarium, and the hospital didn't let me use their radiology department, so I used the vet's <laughs> x-ray. <And> this <laughs> is what happens, everybody. If you choose to donate your body to science, your head will end up in a goldfish tank. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, strapped around all kinds of wires because I had to flex the head, and then I had to extend the head. That's and fucked up. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you do what you got to do. Did any part of you, did you, or was that it? Was it just becomes clinical and just work? You you can dissociate or, or detach from the fact that this was a live head at some point? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a bit of personification in the process because it, dissection is very difficult when you're actually removing. Like in med school, you just do some right? Like you just dissect, you look at everything, right? But if you actually have to cut off and create ligate injuries, it's a lot more work. So mm -hmm. you spend a lot of time. So you, it's okay to give them a special name. You have to be respectful mm -hmm. of your cadaver. Like the ones that I had that had tattoos, I could name them after the tattoos and I would see on their bodies, for example. But, mm -hmm. but the medical schools are very, 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 very strict about any kind of manipulation of the body right and uh even a wrong slice with the scalpel of a, a of a muscle that you weren't supposed to dissect you know you get in trouble for that and uh, and burials are always you know done respectfully at mm -hmm. the end mm -hmm. of all the the dissections so Jesus. giving your body to science is a good thing even to first-year medical students oh yeah of course <laughs> you know doing the good thing 
And uh, yeah, I mean, students could always use um, use. I want to donate my head to um, uh, to hair school so they can <laughs> work on a dead head. I'll give it a well, perm. I've give it a. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, Evita Academy have a whole bunch of. I was telling Chris, my son, this like he it's you have the hair and everything, and it's just the heads, right? Mm -hmm. So they would take these tripods and they fix the head on the tripod, and then they'd give them curls, like exactly what you're saying. But uh, and they have, but like, not like a dead head, like no a, styrofoam. Okay. But they have beautiful <laughs> eyes and makeup and stuff. Like imagine how many girlfriends you could have at home. Because when we're they're done with them, I was asking them because it's a teaching academy at mm -hmm. King and Young, and haircuts are only like twenty bucks, and you're there for three hours. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. You should really interview the school. I think you should. Maybe I will. And maybe they'll give you a collection of heads. But your hair <laughs> would definitely, <laughs> your your hair would definitely be. Uh, I think, because I'm very hair envious, by the way, uh, I think, Julien, that's like, Thank I used you. to have hair like you, but at <laughs> 54. <laughs> you have a nice head of hair. You're, you're right? Yeah, but it's, it's, well, I, I have every day, part of my prayers, thank you. And that's why I go to Evira, because I still get to play with it, right? You're young, you're a fit, young looking guy. I mean, uh, yeah, that's it. So <laughs> 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 you got from all the talking i've been doing i was unplussed by your statement <laughs> but thank you at my age you're supposed to take whatever you can get so i'll say thank you because <laughs> you i mean fitness is obviously really important to you it you, is um you it's go to the, the secret gym every morning at 5 30 uh you don't look 54 you look thank about you. 68 <laughs> 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 no you look you look young like in your 40s easily um and and again, I admire your out of the box approach to your career because, like I said before, the way I would have pictured it, you get a practice or a partner in a practice, you do that for a certain amount of years, you go to the same place, you retire, you sort of opened up uh, these uh, fitness facilities and this and, and and all this, and you've also done some cool stuff like uh, you were a chiropractor on set for music videos. Is that it? No, just the film industry, Ontario just Film Board. So how did you get involved with that? You went to film school? No, that was kind that of was like a hobby after. after. But, uh, no, so during practice. it was. I had patients who were involved with the Ontario Film Board. Mm -hmm. And then I had, just through word of mouth, because I worked, you know, Young St. Clair, and then I worked at Young and Wellesley in the orthopedic hospital there. Mm -hmm. So that being in the downtown core, right, you see a lot of uh, actors and professionals like you. And so it was just word of mouth. Directors would come in, and then they put you on the list, and then you just suddenly, if you do good, then you, they just, you're on the call list. And then if something happens... They either come to you or they put you in a van, blindfold you, and take you to wherever they are. Actually, blindfold you. <laughs> no, oh. but sometimes I would, like, you know, like they drop you off a couple of corners, spin you around, and say, come here, come here. And then <laughs> the first thing you don't know where you are, you know. <laughs> and so what was, uh, tell us a little bit about some of your experiences doing that. Like, what kind of uh, sets have you worked on? Well, I did, a, I did uh, mainly... Uh, the big, the big movies, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, you know the A-list uh, actors, and uh, and also their entourage, right? Like the support team. Like who? Like drop names. Like, and what movies did you work on? Uh, the biggest one for me was X Men. Mm -hmm. uh, the AD uh, was uh, coming to me, and then he referred me to, and he was referred by Kiefer Sutherland, mm -hmm. who uh, was doing other other shoots. Um, let's see now. You may have to pause this because it's been a while, and I'm not really like you know the uh, I'm not really a, like a name dropper, right, like right. starstruck, right? So right. I would just go and so this just work for you. You it doesn't even register sometimes who you're who you're working on. No, not really. Like uh, who was it that was? Um, uh, Anyway, she had just finished a movie with Jim Carrey, and I didn't know who she was. <laughs> she was so insulted. <laughs> She's like, she got off the table, turned around. She goes, you don't know who I am? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Sure, I wonder who that was. <laughs> Renee Zellweger? <laughs> no. No, and she's uh, uh, she's from New York, and both her parents are uh, also actors. And it'll come to me. Believe me, it'll come to me. Mm -hmm. Um 
So, so the, you know, uh, like I said, you know, it was like more about like treating uh, the whole set and the people. And I'd set up a, 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 a table there and uh, Ellen's wife, what's her name? Oh, Portia. Uh, Portia de Rossi. Yeah. She was, and then that was actually, that was another big movie. I was there almost like every day with uh, uh, Tim Allen mm-hmm. and uh, RuPaul and uh, uh, Richard Dreyfus. Mm-hmm. You know, and do you ever find uh, do you find a difference in working with an A lister, say, than you would just anybody else? They're more ex- like for chiropractic. They're there's you know they're more experienced. They 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 know what it's all about. They mm-hmm. know that they perform better with you know the care if it's needed. You know, um, and the other guy, but they're not suffering as much as you know uh, the ones who are have to hold the mics, right, it's like, <laughs> the set, right? you know, people working actually on the, the actual sets, mm-hmm. you know. So that's why I always balanced and I always brought a table and I would work the set and have lunch with them and, mm-hmm. you know. So I did that for for quite a quite a bit of time, actually. Uh, and uh, then my accessibility was limited at one time because I actually moved to Burlington because I built this dream house back then, you know, and... I wanted to build it downtown Toronto. I'm surprised I didn't end up in Saskatchewan, you know, for mm. land costs. <laughs> but right. I, I lucked out with a, a plot in Burlington and so on the escarpment there. So. And did you still have that or you sold that? I sold it to mm-hmm. a doctor that I worked with at the Street Youth Clinic. I did some volunteer work there for five years at the Shell Clinic. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Reuven G- Girard. And you, uh, mu- you worked on music videos too, right? Didn't you say you took Chris to uh, your son Chris to some music videos or something like that? You worked some some hip hop artists or something. Oh, uh, he actually wasn't with me on those. Uh, these guys were doing. Uh, there was Fifty Cent. Right. Uh, there was like an island party, Toronto island party, um, and uh, Chris was with me at with DMX. But him, it wasn't a set thing. We he, we just came uh, across him at Foot Locker. <laughs> DMX at Foot Locker. <laughs> yeah. And I drove a Land Rover back then, which was the hot car, right? So right. so he left, and I kept saying in Foot Locker, come on, go go say hi. He's like your role model, model other than Tupac, right? And he, he just wouldn't. He was just so, you know, like starstruck. And I, he wasn't starstruck with anybody else that I would take him on set. But him, no way would he say hello. Really? So then I had the Land Rover, right? Back to the Land Rover. And so he was actually, so we went, we left and I yelled at him the whole way, right? Like, you should have, you should have. This is important, you know, for you to just not feel any kind of like apprehension. Or, mm-hmm. And uh, so I saw him. He was on the phone on the street. So I stopped my car right in front of him and I had tinted windows. So he probably thought someone was going to shoot him. <laughs> and Chris was like, Dad, Dad, keep driving, keep driving. And I slowly lowered the window. And he looked inside and he saw Chris. Chris did his like side uh, horizontal peace sign and he <laughs> did <laughs> so DMX did the same rolled the window up and we just kept driving and that was it hilarious no <laughs> words exchanged <laughs> no words that's funny um let's talk a little bit about what we've been working on together uh, the past uh, few weeks you wrote a book when you wrote a book a few years back Right. Yeah, I figured Chris was 16, mm-hmm. given when we were reading and I was talking about Maxim magazine in it and stuff. So he was, yeah, so 15 years, Chris is 30. And so talk a little bit about uh, the premise of the book. It's called Sex on the Single Spine. And it's about using sex as the medicine to fix chronic back pain. I'm sure a lot of people didn't know you could do that. And I didn't either right. until my patients, female patients, came to me. And I was treating them and treating them and treating them. And then they would say, you know what? Got late on the weekend. Back pain's gone. So I would have been an idiot to not ask the right questions. What, right. what questions would you ask? What position? <laughs> what position did you do? Very good, Doctor Mosquito Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I graduated from Blackfly to Mosquito. Oh, was it Blackfly? It was Blackfly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that would be a good name for a rapper, I think, Blackfly Hunter. But uh, yeah, I, that's exactly what I did. I redid some orthopedic tests, asked what their favorite positions are, and I kind of put it together clinically that way. And it happened not only once, but twice and three times. So you know, I would have been an idiot not to actually, you know, be excited at the possibilities of writing a book about 
using sex to fix your back. And having had been in practice for years, you know, unless you have cancer these days, you're not going to buy a book, a self-help book right. to help you, you know, with, you know, any other kind of, you know, I've, when was the last time you bought a book about your constipation? Uh, yesterday. Uh, really? <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> well, I couldn't shit, so I went to chapters. Uh, no, no, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's true, people, uh, but I feel like this one, I mean, it's a funny book too. It's got a lot of humor, so I feel like people will be will be drawn to it. And you you got the concept from women patients telling you about it. Did you have to do any field research yourself? Well, <clears throat> I have. If it was today, when I did back then, I would be in serious trouble with human resources. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not with the College of Chiropractors, I mean, just with human resources, because you're just not supposed to do things with your secretary the way that you know. That you did, and on, and but really, I've learned quickly too that I would get more practice humping pillows uh, than I did uh, any other, in, and I had to do it for the sake of research. <laughs> so you actually humped pillows for certain exercises. Yeah, I it's had not to, creepy I had to, if it's for research. You're right. You know, like so, yeah. But how do you know if uh, the back, uh, the pillow's back is fixed? You need real demons. <laughs> oh yeah, so just feel I better. To, just feel yeah. better. You know, that would be an interesting thing is to draw a nice figure on the pillow. Right. Uh -huh. Interesting on the pillowcase. <laughs> on the pillowcase. Right. Um, you say you uh, did things with your secretary. What do you mean? Like, like actual sex or just positioning, dry humping? <laughs> like elaborate on that a little bit. What do you mean? Nurse, <laughs> please lie down in this position. We must do research. <laughs> yeah? And they were game? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, what would, what would you do if you had accessibility as a, a young doctor? You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I'm reading your mail. I think I'm picking up what you're throwing down. Okay. So it was accessible. So why not use the resources available to you? Is what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, but in today you can't do anything. You can't even like look at them the wrong way. You can't even comment on lipstick color. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just uh, the world has become very tight and kind of anal, if you excuse the pun. <laughs> tight and anal. Okay. <laughs> tight anal world. Loosen up. That world. should be my second book. <laughs> yeah. It's a tight anal word world by Dr. Michelle Rice yeah. writing this from prison. <laughs> um, yeah, because are you single? Yes. How many years have you been single? I'd have to say five. Five. And uh, so or do, do you date? Do you play the field? Because again, you're a young, fit looking guy, you know, Success well, really successful. You're basically retired. I'm in, I'm in medical school. I consider myself as a student doing consulting with the x-ray thing. That's mm -hmm. what I'm doing right now, right? right? And I'm hoping that the book will take me to a new level of being able to share my, my experiences uh, by doing some appearances, by doing maybe some mm -hmm. corporate seminars and stuff like that. But uh, I because I've been I know you're gonna lead back to this, so I will come back to it. <laughs> is I was in I was in medical school. You can't buy time. Right. So you can find the richest guy in his fifties and sixties and say, I've got the solution to make you twenty five years younger instantly. And what do you have to do? You go back to school. Mm -hmm. And you sit in that little blue chair <laughs> with a bunch of twenty somethings. And so you go to Chicago to uh, finish this you're going at the end of the month and how are you finding it in med school are you getting hit on a lot by people in their 20s like is that <laughs> <laughs> so I'd have to say that uh, it was a an extremely uh, in a humble way uh, uh, and I'm having trouble be only because it's English and I don't use these words often in my language about how it was very complimentative for me. Flattering. Flattering. Thank mm -hmm. you. Flattering that uh, I was literally competing 
well, there was no competition there. Mm-hmm. It was like, it was incredible. And, uh, and you know, like even if it's in Chicago, you're actually on an island. Mm-hmm. So it gets even worse, right? Because you're stuck on an island. Because the academic program, programs for certain medical schools are done on the island. They put you on the island and they just torture you mm-hmm. for 16 months to do all of the courses you have to take. So you're there. So it was, yeah, it was quite the, quite the... And how do you resist not following through when you have people like 22-year-old girls that are throwing themselves at you? Because here you come in, you're successful, you're already established, you're, you're coming back to enhance your education, you're a fit guy. How do you resist pursuing girls that are younger than your own son? <laughs> you had to throw that one in there. <laughs> I mean, I was taking pictures on my iPhone at beer pongs, and I plus I was I became the president of this student governing council. I beat a world record for being the oldest president, and you have to be student elected for this. You got to be popular. As, there's an right, element. Right. Of, and uh, so I'm taking pictures of beer pongs, and Chris is like, you know, Dad, there's something seriously wrong with this picture. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to answer your question, babies, you know, you're still not. And I would like, I would like. Like when things happen, mm-hmm. drama happens with your 22, 25 year old. It's more like 25 year old, right. you know, special friends, mm-hmm. uh, uh, student friends. You, I will, I would like, you know, text my friends in Toronto and they say, don't be mad at them. She's just being a 25 year old. Right, right. You know, and what do you mean drama? Thing. Like what kind of things would, ha- would you be involved with? Uh, drama. Well, (laughs) pretty much everything to a 25-year-old who is in medical school, because the nature of the beast, right? Like, you're, like, you're tortured by masses of information. It's competitive, right? Yeah. It's survival of the fittest situation. And then you have hormones kicking in, right? Yeah, and you're in that world. All of a sudden, you get caught up. And then it's just like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're right. They're just being 25-year-olds or yeah. whatever. And there's Friday night on the beach and the Crown Royal. And you do things you're not supposed to. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you, you uh, the drama is can be dramatic to say the least <laughs> you heard it here first the drama can be dramatic that's a tattoo i want to get um and and you said that chiropractors don't like chiropractors i'm going to assume that's once you graduate or once you're out in the field why is that it's just a, a it's a, again it's it's competitive you mm-hmm. know fighting for the new patient you know and so this is speaking from my experience you know that uh, uh, generally the chiropractic model of wellness is not the same as medicine. It, and I can say that now because I am on my way to being both and I'm three quarters of my way through the MD program, mm-hmm. right? And I see the attitude in helping the patient, solving the problems. And, uh, uh, and I had numerous conversations with MDs about this matter about how chiropractors are right and, and so uh, from from a respectful doctor to doctor chiro to to MD not student right because mm-hmm. I uh, you know I had good relationships with the professors because of my age and my clinical experience so um, where were we going at with that oh yeah the competitiveness so right. and chiros like they don't work together they work individualistic, mm-hmm. like a dentist, for example, right? You, you see it in Toronto, right? They're setting up their office and the sandwich boards and stuff. So when a patient has a problem, it's not, oh, well, let's consider these options. It's more, well, my technique does this, and this mm-hmm. is the way I am. And, oh, it's, you know, so you see a patient come, chiro hoppers, we call them. They go from chiro to chiro to chiro, right? Mm-hmm. And there's no interdisciplinary conversation. But if a doctor does that, of course, you want to see all the data. You want to come together right. and solve and, and if I do research in something and another doctor wants MD wants to do the research like great do it please let's hope we get the same results you know what I mean it's right, like, right. Uh, but chiropractic doesn't really work that way hmm. and so and it's the dollar right and it's uh, it's all about the dollar in, right, in right. medicine and in, in chiro for that matter right uh, uh, so talk a little bit about because uh, one of your friends that you mentioned in the book several times and uh, he's a big supporter of yours and vice versa is dr. Ho talk, talk to people a little bit about uh, 
How did you meet with him? And actually, if you could, just who is Dr. Ho for some of the listeners uh, who may not know? Dr. Ho has become the number one uh, shopping network across the world, basically, for products that are designed to help with physical and mental, but mainly physical orthopedic pain. Mm -hmm. And so uh, his products uh, are research-based, and they're accepted throughout the world in the medical community by insurances covering, let's say, the cost of his products. Uh, And uh, his biggest talent is to be able to understand the needs of real people right and their pain and what they need to do to really have a, a, you know reduction of their pain mm-hmm. relief from their pain and so his first machine I, I was in school with him we were uh you know best friends uh in uh chiropractic college and uh he had a family then and he worked and was a student and he did acupuncture back then and he you know did that on the side so he was like really very much a a business guy Mm -hmm. you know like he was a survivor and he and so he really understood business so he used this chiropractic you know degree to uh to uh you know empower his business Mm -hmm. and so his first device was a tens based unit Right, uh, they call the pain therapy system, and then he's developed some belts and some neck comforters, and everything is designed to reduce pain in your spine and your feet. Right now, uh, uh, and a, a big part of what he's doing is also using this the power of electricity to improve circulation. So feet, for example, di- diabetes, nerve problems. Right, so, and uh, and I kept saying, keep saying, I can't say this uh, enough is. His genius is that he has become the doctor around the world that can help patients for real at home. Right, right. Right? Because how much, uh, what, what do people do once they get around? You know, they go see the doctor. They're not going to stick to therapy, mm-hmm. right? They're not going to get massage once a week, you know, and all this. So people need options that are not medicinal in nature, right? Drugs. Mm-hmm. And so he, everything has been tested properly so he's kind of like got the he's got the solution and because his his brand has his name in it too that empowers it even more i think right you know because there's a lot of companies other companies that have you know like but they call it like smith or whatever right right he has the name behind it yeah yeah and so um so he's uh his factory his main factory is in china and he produces everything and with his wife and the uh, quality control is all First hand, mm-hmm. and his son uh, Vince is uh, a big part of the team uh, in terms of promoting the, prov- the, the 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 products, and he's doing a bit of HSN and TSC now, and uh, and his daughter Stephanie also she's a marketing genius. So they're such a and they're very educated. They have all they went to university, Ivy Business School, you know, London Western, and uh, and so they're using uh, you know uh, their degrees and to empower the business. Uh, so it's become really a, a family, a very, very, you know, big family Hugely business. Hugely successful, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, there you go, everybody. So now you're pretty much retired. You're a student. You get up at an ungodly hour every day. To <laughs> describe a day in the life of student Dr. Michelle Rice. Well, right now my... New puppy. Right, Chocolate Lab. Chocolate Lab, Storm, wakes me up at about 2.30 to 3 (laughs) a.m. So at that time, I say, are you kidding, honey? We're going back to bed. (laughs) Uh, So I, uh, but normally I get up at between, let's say, 4.30, 5 Mm a.m. And uh, I will, you know, do a few things like... uh, Empty the dishwasher and vacuum and do some loads of laundry. Then I go work out. Then I come back and, uh, you know, study. <laughs> and then come here. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
uh, I, I want I do, your life so badly. I do go to bed early, though. You know, I always say to people, you know, like, you got to do the math, right? You really do. People do need, age dependent. You need less as you age, of course. Mm-hmm. But you do, if you need six to eight hours, eight hours, more science now is proving more. It's eight, right? Mm-hmm. At your age. Mm-hmm. Do the math. And if you don't want to get up at 6 a.m., fine. Get up at noon. But do the math. Count right. eight hours backwards. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I, I sent uh, Dr. Rice a message yesterday about today's recording session. <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, let's meet tomorrow. The earlier, the better for me. I got a response from him saying, uh, sure, we could do 640 at the studio <laughs> after my work. And I'm like, okay, that was a mistake. <laughs> that was a mistake. Let's try for eight, and then I pushed it back to nine. But have you been to the gym at 5.30 a.m.? I haven't. We go to the same gym, and it's uh, the Yorkville Club here in Toronto. It's amazing. Um, no, I haven't. The earliest I've gone, I think, is maybe 7 or 7.30. Quite the crowd. Yeah, I bet. I'm, I would. I don't know if I could lift or do anything at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> I will start going to the gym at 5.30 in the morning when they have beds in the locker room <laughs> so i can show up at 5 30 sign in sleep for three hours then do my workout <laughs> and you pretend you're meditating right that's right yeah <laughs> tm it's all it's the new thing um anything you would like to plug good sir you're on twitter at uh what's your twitter handle it's at dr michelle rice okay michelle m-i-c-h-e-l rice as in rice and uh, follow him because then you can get updates on the uh, sex and the single spine that will be you're all it's all self-published and everything yeah and uh, can peep is it available now if or, or not yet no we're gonna lo- we're, the plan is to launch it uh, just after the holidays just after the holidays so yeah. look for that follow him on twitter look for sex and the single spine and uh, thanks for doing the interview appreciate it. it was a good chat Thank you for having me. My pleasure, and watch your head. And we must end by saying, thank you for having me, Black Fly Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> what was your name? Or what is? Uh, it was Wild Rice. Wild Rice. Like the, like oh. the, the food. You know, I would have like, gone with Basmati. And there it is, episode 18, Barely Legal. That's right. Thank you for listening. Thanks to my guest, Dr. Michelle Rice. Thanks to my producer, Adam Fox. And thanks to my sound engineer, Miles Lacroix. And thank you to you. Always you. I appreciate you. You. Email the show, pod, P-O-D, at jdcomedyhour.com. Follow on Instagram and Twitter, at jdcomedyhour. Go to facebook.com slash jdcomedyhour. Yeah. All that good stuff. Come to Say What, Toronto peeps, tomorrow, Wednesday, November 19th, for the Julian Dion Comedy Hour live show. It's a great one. It's a good one. It's a fun one. Garage Baby's there. Everybody's there. Will you be there? Well, that's the question. Will you be there? What else? I think that's it, everybody. That's that's it. That's all. Thank you always for listening. I appreciate it. Spread the love. If you enjoy the podcast, tell a person. Tell a motherfucker. <laughs> Watch your head.
repeat, <laughs> repeat that. Who do I look like? You look like that picture from far. Well, I'm far. I'm only three feet away, but you look like Kathy Bates in the the new uh, freak uh, American horror story. Because she's got a red beard and she takes her hair like it's her hair's really short. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to add that to my acting resume as far as looks go. <laughs> Have you seen Kathy think, Bates? And- think Eric Stoltz and Kathy Bates. <laughs> no, I haven't. I know you're going to check her out. Oh, I, no, I know who Kathy Bates is. I just she, she wears a red beard just like this. I thought it was her. I thought, oh, I didn't know you watched <laughs> American Horror Story. And it was me.